Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here. It's uh, it's neat to uh, to see Ann Arbor for the first time. I've had friends over the years, of course, who've gone to this school, your great esteemed school for various uh, degrees, and I've never gotten a chance to visit, so nice to be here. It's also Mardi Gras, and I was commenting to Paul on the way over, I'd actually brought some Mardi Gras beads. And then, and I thought, how am I going to remember the Mardi Gras beads? Because they're not really on my normal mental to-do list, you know, like get ready for lecture involves slides and notes, but beads sadly did not make it. And even with all my new eye devices and Apple things, I didn't <laughs> figure out a way to remember them. So, um, so no beads. Uh, but yeah, so I thought, I understand this, this is, you know, you guys are here for about the next 50 minutes or an hour. And, uh, I thought I'd introduce what we're doing first and then frame a couple of issues surrounding distributing drugs and distributing money um, that could lead to a nice discussion. I'll be interested to hear your questions and critiques and everything. So first of all, how many of you have ever heard of the Health Store Foundation or our clinic network in Africa is called the CFW Shops Network? Some of you? Okay. That's neat. I'm always intrigued when the world that I'm immersed in is actually known to anyone except, you know, other than me. Um, so uh, I'll give you, you know, an introduction. The, the, the problem that the Health Store Foundation was organized to solve is a pretty straightforward and easily definable problem, which is you have millions of people every year in the developing world who are suffering and dying of a few diseases that on the surface are easy to prevent or to treat. So things like malaria where how to prevent malaria is well known, there's an arsenal of tools to do so, how to treat malaria is well known, there are drugs that within three days the parasite is cleared from your bloodstream, <coughs> and so on. And yet, all these people continue to die of malaria, especially in Africa. And similarly with respiratory infections and diarrheal diseases, and just those three categories of conditions, malaria, respiratory infections, and diarrheal diseases, in a lot of places uh, account for half the deaths, for example. So it sure seems like, geez, what a, what, a, what a beguilingly simple problem. And surely it's more complex, but couldn't we come up with a solution to distribute these known treatments and prevention tools uh, effectively in these markets? So that's the, that's the context of the, f the founding of the Health Store Foundation and why we're doing what we do is to improve access to basic health care so people don't have to suffer and die unnecess unnecessarily of these things. Um, so on the surface, a supply-facing solution would say, okay, let's uh, put horizontal clinics that are attractive <laughs> because people have never seen a clinic. No. So, um, uh, you know, we'd say, well, there are high-quality drugs in these markets, and even though most people are getting, a lot of people are getting substandard drugs, half the drugs in these markets are counterfeit or otherwise substandard, surely we can find high-quality drugs and we can figure out a way to distribute them through low-cost uh, clinics. Maybe they look something like this little clinic. You could rent a little storefront, and can you rotate that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, right. So um, uh, surely you could put up little clinics and, and do that. And how would you put up a bunch of clinics that maintain standards over a wide geographical area? Well, you might use franchising because in many industries, franchising sets standards and maintains them across a lot of outlets. So we may not agree with sort of the, 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 you know, the fat content of McDonald's hamburgers or something like that, but nevertheless, we all have to concede that McDonald's does maintain the standards that they do maintain, for example, with regards to uh, you know preparation of food in a way that doesn't make people acutely ill with food poisoning, it just basically doesn't happen at McDonald's, even though they have thirty thousand outlets all over the place, different suppliers and all that. So it's not just McDonald's; it's hotel chains, it's gas stations, it's all kinds of industries that use franchising. So can't we use franchising to distribute medicine in the developing world? So voila, you have. The CFW network, here's a typical one of our clinics. You can see our brand is CFW Clinics, which stands for Child and Family Wellness Clinics. It's a standard format with standard signage and colors and training manuals um, uh, uh, telling the nurse how to operate the clinic according to this system. So we're not licensing just the sign 
We're not licensing just a set of a subset of products. We're not licensing just uh, you know a backend point of you know a point of sale device and backend database or something. It's a whole business format and way of doing business from marketing, record keeping, what's on the menu, how pricing is handled, and so on. And so we've opened. Uh, 67 of these clinics in Kenya, 25 in Rwanda. We've served well over 3 million people so far and have plans for more markets and more clinics. So wonderful, but, and, and, I th and I think it's great, but I'm not here really to pitch you on our idea or our brand. Instead, I wanted to focus on some of the complexities that emerge when you actually try to do this, when you set up these clinics. What, what really happens when the rubber meets the road? Do patients really come and so on? So. Two topics I'll introduce, then we can discuss. The first one, again, is specifically things that arise when in distributing pharmaceuticals. Um, four categories that I'll touch on brief briefly here. First one is inventory management. So one might assume, and we did assume, that if you own a clinic and you're serving a community where people are literally dying for lack of these particular products, like malaria medicine, and suddenly you have this clinic where you're assured a secure supply of high quality malaria medicine, and so on, you will keep your clinic in stock and be able to operate it profitably, and you'll succeed. Well, sort of, yes, some of our franchisees do that, but many of them don't maintain adequate inventory. Things intervene in this in this picture, in this scenario, to prevent um, adequate inventory from uh, being in the outlet. So for example, many of the franchisees, as you've probably heard in other businesses operating in these areas, many of the franchisees will, and this, you know, so a nurse, I should have said a nurse is typically the franchisee for us. So a nurse will own and operate this clinic, and I can show you, hopefully, so usually there's not, unfortunately, this many people crowding around a clinic. This is a day when we had some health education happening. Um, that is what a clinic looks like in a more sort of peri-urban setting. You can see some laundry hanging above or to the left. Um, I thought that was just a great photo with the kids running. So that's another. You can see we rent a storefront and outfit it as a clinic. We don't build buildings. Nothing capital intensive, costs about $5,000 to open a clinic. Inside there's a waiting room and our franchisee has uh, a CFW lab coat looking uniform. Um, they, besides offering curative treatment and counseling, they have some over-the-counter products. So in the back, you may not be able to recognize it in the photo, but there's some mosquito nets, some toothpaste, soap, bleach, hand washing kind of stuff, water purification, hygiene items. And then they have pharmaceuticals, uh, again, targeted at the short list of diseases that we are focused on. So, uh, so with regards to inventory management, um, some of our franchisees mingle their personal and business income. They'll have school fees come up. Their children are in school, have to pay school fees. Someone has just paid them to, for malaria medicine, and instead of buying more malaria medicine, they take it out of the business, pay the school fees. Suddenly, they have less money than they need to restock. They don't have as much stock. They don't have as much stock to sell. They have even less money to restock. And it's a sort of downward spiral. Um, that's, one, um, that's one issue. There's, there's also sort of basic understanding of our nurses and how do you keep inventory. Let's say at the end of the month, we say part of the system, part of the CFW system is at the end of every month you count how much stock you have. Write it down on your profit and loss statement. Well, then they look at, like see those big jugs of, of uh, you know, paracetamol and other things? Well, how do you count how much of that is left? It's not totally obvious. Um, you know, you kind of say, well, there's 80% of it. It looks like there's 80% left. Or maybe I wrote down, I gave these doses, but it doesn't quite seem to match. And so there's confusion. And so the P&L gets confused and taking inventory is confused. Credit policies of suppliers are often not attuned to the delivery cycle and order press processing time necessary to get to these outlets, which are really remote. So you'll have a supplier in Nairobi who's used to selling to outlets that can easily be reached in a day and have access to normal banks and so on. And so they, you know, they'll have say maybe cash on delivery as they have no credit. And so that doesn't really work for our franchisees. Um, there are 
uh, you know, seasonal variations in the customer's income when you have people who are subsistence farmers. Some, they sell their tea and they have a bunch of cash, and then a few months later they have no cash. Um, so uh, those are some of the reasons why inventory management is not as straightforward and what you run into when, even though it seems on paper, you have malaria medicine for X, you can sell it to the franchisee, they can sell it for X plus some percentage, they should have enough money at the end of the month to buy more, sometimes they don't. Um, so we've taken a range of actions with regards to this particular issue. We've trained franchisees in different ways. We've intervened with, between suppliers to change credit policies. We've, uh, right now we're in partnership with Kiva Zip, which is a new part of Kiva that you can see here's one of our franchisees, Rachel Wanjuki, and she says over there, a loan of $250 helps me purchase more drugs and so on. This is a no interest loan that you know, you guys or anyone online can help her to have access to these funds. So that's something we're trying just in the moment with a few franchisees. Um, we've had something interesting this last year was we switched, in order to reduce the order processing time, we changed from franchisees ordering on paper to them simply calling in their orders, um, which, you know, there's all this talk about mobile clinic management and mobile phones and all that stuff. Well, telephone calls themselves are still the most amazing thing you can do on a phone, just to be honest, from a personal perspective, right? I mean, I can call you, you're somewhere else in the world, and there's your voice in real time. You don't need any software. Yeah? Point, so, a point of clarification, do, they, yeah. do your franchises generally order through you, or you just help them set up the shop and then they independently have relationships with the farmers and suppliers? Yeah, so, we, so, they, so they can only order from approved sources, and this is one of the main ways we maintain standards. If we find drugs from another source, then we shut down the clinic, basically forcing ourselves as a bottleneck between the masses of substandard drugs and patients. Um, the order tends to come through us. Um, and one reason is, for example, in this telephone ordering, it did, it did cut down the processing time dramatically because we didn't have to drive and get the paper order form, which was what we expected. But also, it had the benefit that we did not expect that it allowed us to coach franchisees on their inventory. So they would say, well, I want to order you know, 500 of this. And we'd say, you only ordered 10 last month. And they'd say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we added, added an extra zero or you know, whatever it was. So. Um, this has been a big benefit of, of having telephone orders. Um, so, so that's inventory management. Next topic under uh, pharmaceutical distribution is distortions in the market. So let me just give you an example. There are products that are very um, beneficial that we want to distribute and yet are the subject of intentional distortions by other agencies that we kind of have to abide by. And it's difficult. So for example, PSI, you probably know Population Services International is a huge NGO, half a billion dollar a year budget. It's grown enormously in the last 20 or 25 years um, with US government funding and other funding. So here's a simple example. Long lasting insecticide mosquito nets are very important to prevent malaria. They can last five years. You don't have to dip them in insecticide once in a while. And yet, if you just buy them off the street, it might be five or six or seven dollars in Kenya to buy one of these nets, which is a disincentive to customers, especially who are really poor. So PSI has subsidized long-lasting nets that we can access. So in a sense, this is wonderful. Again, on behalf of all the franchisees, we can set up this sort of vendor relationship with PSI. We can source nets and so on. So PSI charges our franchisees 40 shillings. KSH means Kenya shillings. They mandate that our franchisees sell the nets for 50 shillings because they want the subsidy that's been given by sort of the global community towards malaria efforts to be passed on to the patient. They don't want the <laughs> franchisee to just get a lower cost good and then keep the profits. And yet we've calculated that for us in our particular locations, the cost of distributing one net is approximately 13 shillings. Well, it's an instant problem. The franchisee, if, are they going to consider this a loss leader? or are they going to just quit selling nets, or what? So you know, I have some what to do about net distribution. Um, should we cover nets some other way? And this is, by the way, this is an issue right now. We have to decide. This is an example. I wake up in the morning. I've asked my colleague in Kenya, tell me how much the distribution is. We divide it. 
13 shillings, what are we going to do? Can we, you know, we talk to PSI, can you change the 40, can you change the 50, no, no. Does it really cost that much to distribute them? Can't these other people distribute them? So we kind of scurry around trying to find a solution. But that's an example of how a distortion in the market. We don't want to not distribute long-lasting nets. And the franchisees love getting these nets. They sell thousands of them. Yeah? What's in that cost? What's in which cost? The cost of distribution. Uh, mostly it's paying people to drive in a truck with nets, which are paid by kilogram from one place to another, $10 a gallon gas. We've looked at different couriers and different systems, you know. Can't you put them on a Coke truck or something? I mean, it always sounds good, but basically the answer is no. Um, so, uh, and then another thing with these distortions is you never know, will you really be able to get, for example, these nets forever or subsidize malaria medicine? So, you know, as someone who's managing a supply chain, are we going to get these, or how many nets can we get this quarter? How many nets can we get this year? How much subsidized malaria medicine can we get this quarter or this year? Even at the top of the top experts in the global health community, at least that I know, whether from the manufacturers, the policymakers, the subsidizing entities, the regulators, the Department of Malaria Control in Kenya, none of them can answer that question because they don't know. It's, they don't know how long the global will will last and how much money will manifest itself in Kenya and our particular clinics for these kind of products. So it's kind of, you know, with, with organizations like ours are left with a guessing game about how do we communicate this to patients and so on. Um, another thing that is involved in pharmaceutical distribution is patient perception. So it's one thing to say, well, all these people are dying for lack of high quality malaria medicine. Why don't they just get tested for malaria and then take these drugs? Well, Yes, many patients feel like that, but also patients are used to other things. They're used to just walking down the street to a chemist and buying a drug for, say, 25 U.S. cents equivalent. And to try to convince them to, to buy a drug for more expensive or to take a diagnostic test is difficult. As an example, here's a, this, these are some children looking at a malaria diagnostic test of the kind that we can legally use and promote and the global health community loves and are very accurate, so scientifically they're great. Um, we had some issues, for example, some patients wouldn't take such a test because it looks like an HIV test. They didn't want people to know their HIV status. So things like that can certainly be worked through through the web of trust that, we've, that our clinicians and nurses have, have uh, established in their communities. But nevertheless, it's an example of the kind of obstacle that comes uh, with regards to patient perception. Lastly, what I like to call apples to apples competition versus apples to oranges competition. I'm sure there's actual real names for this, but um, in an ideal situation, there would be laws and you could depend on them and you know, people who are breaking laws would be enforced and the laws would make sense for rural areas and so on. The reality is that, for example, many chemists, drug sellers, and others in Kenya operate laboratories illegally. Uh, they, they operate laboratories that are themselves illegal and that are being operated illegally. So they're not configured legally and they are not registered. Um, and they avoid lots of costs by doing that. If we set up a legal lab, we have to operate legally because we have this whole branded network. If we set up a legal lab next to one of these illegal labs, we have to more than double the cost of opening a clinic. It's like $7,500 worth of equipment for the lowest tier of lab in Kenya. Then you need to pay a lab tech. Then you need to have a refrigerator. Then you need to have reagents. And that complicates the whole inventory management problem that we just, just talked about. So um, in a sense, who cares? But the reality is patients are used to, again, back to patient perception, patients are used to walking up and getting a lab test. And so they say, well, CFW clinics, it's a high quality brand. You don't have, you don't have a lab? Doesn't make sense so, to them. So that's uh, this apples to oranges comp uh, you know, competition. We've tried various things. We've tried opening labs or opening clinics without labs and making the case that we're competing on drug quality, for example. We've tried opening clinics with labs and seeing if we can recoup the cop uh, cost. We've tried. Uh, trying to get regulations changed. That's always a long and interesting process, but it's conceivable. Um, we've tried having our clinics partner with other labs that are nearby. 
or think about putting referral labs. And then mostly we've tried using rapid diagnostic tests like the one whose photo I showed you that are legally able to be used by nurses without additional personnel and a lot of additional equipment. That's an area for engineers and others to, it's a whole different discussion I'd love to have with any of you who, you know, there's a, it's an active space, the rapid diagnostic space. People are developing different tests, but most of them are not actually available in a place like Kenya yet. Um, uh, a few more minutes. So that's all I have to say about distributing drugs. The other topic I wanted to talk a little bit about is distributing money, and I'll keep this one short so we can have a discussion. Um, we observe that many organizations who strive to serve patients at the base of the pyramid do one of two things. Either they kind of find that there's not enough money or they can't figure out how to get the money or operate at low enough costs at the base of the pyramid, so they move up the pyramid and sort of abandon the poorest of the poor, which we don't want to do, but they still might end up doing great things if they do that. Or they stay at the base of the pyramid, but they abandon the business disciplines that you would hope would drive standards and efficiencies and other things that private businesses can offer. So we've avoided moving up the pyramid, and we've avoided, I think, abandoning too many business disciplines uh, by insulating our franchisees, our clinics, from some costs. So we have paid some license fees on behalf of franchisees. We have provided them services like driving things to their outlets, which is expensive like in the bed nets example, without them really paying the full cost of that. We've kept it so that franchisees have to pay the full cost of the drugs they buy. They pay a markup on that. They pay their rent, they pay their, you know, any employees they have, they pay other costs. But um, we've insulated them from costs and we've paid some things on their behalf. And we think that that is not the best way, in retrospect, that we could route those subsidies, if you think of those as essentially subsidies. Um, so we have some ideas about how to route subsidies better that will lead to better long-term results for us. We have some exciting things going on right now. In fact, um, we've designed, along with two young economists, one at Yale and one at USC, we've designed some uh, mobile phone-based uh, coupons that we're distributing. In fact, the first ones are being distributed tomorrow. I wish it were yesterday so I could tell you if anyone had responded to the coupons yet. but. Um, We've collected information, mobile phone numbers, and taken asset surveys of various people in communities near our some of our clinics. So an asset survey is like how many goats do you have, what is the roof of your house made of, um, things that can be indicators of wealth and poverty in places with no formal employment history or tax returns or credit history, any bank accounts, anything. So take asset surveys, we've done this with 800 people, then we're randomizing a bunch of coupons that give discounts and different pricing on our services and products, both preventive products and curative products. And we're going to distribute those to, via text message to all these 800 people and see who comes. Do people really respond to a 70 shilling discount more than they do to a 35 shilling discount? Will they be incentivized to take sort of systemically beneficial and efficient prevention measures instead of just waiting to get sick? Can they do that with these sort of pricing tests? Um, will they bring their poor friends? Will they go find poor people in their community who could really use this coupon that they get on their phone? And so on. So um, that's an interesting short-term test we want to use to determine uh, some initial findings about uh, pricing and this idea of subsidizing in a different way. In the long term, we want all subsidies to be routed as revenue to franchisees from the bottom up instead of uh, paying for inputs from the top down. like we're going to pay your license fee no matter what kind of clinic you're operating or how you're operating it. We're going to drive stuff to you without reference to the real cost of doing that and so on. So those are my brief remarks on subsidies and distributing money, um, but I'd love to discuss any of this or other things. There's you know lots of other aspects of this that are interesting to discuss, but I thought those two of drugs and money might be interesting. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, to take them in turn, we have funded uh, the subsidies and par other parts of this endeavor, basically the franchisor that recruits, trains, and 
um, drives things to franchisees, collects records, deals with the vendors and all that um, through grants and donations. And so by opening up a different way of subsidizing care, we think, and it's a theory, we think that, that, that donors will see that as an opportunity for their donor money to be used more transparently, more efficiently, in a more targeted fashion. Um, we'll be able to tell people, you know, if, if the subsidy price we set is something like every time a franchisee treats a person of such and such demographic for malaria, the franchisee gets an extra dollar or whatever it is. That donor who gave that dollar, that's a lot different feeling to be able to say, you know, a 34-year-old woman in such and such and such GPS coordinates clinic was served at this date and time and, you know, for malaria. That's totally different than just, we're a social enterprise, we want to drive around, can you buy us a car? I mean, obviously that's not how we say it, but effectively we go to grantors and try to make the case historically that this is worth doing, we're doing it with reasonable efficiency, we're serving all these people, and we can, you know, I, and again, I think, I don't think the way we've done it has been, uh, has been a terrible idea. I think it's worked to keep us at the base of the pyramid, and I think it's pretty efficient. But I think that, that what would be much better is if the franchisee had to earn that revenue and then could pay royalties to the franchisor so that both the franchisee and the franchisor, those incentives are aligned, as they say, and the franchisor really wants to make you know, earn its revenue in the same way that any franchise company makes its revenue, by opening more stores and collecting initial fees and by ongoing royalties or product markups or other things that happen when the franchisees succeed. Um, to take your second question, we generally set our retail prices in these communities competitively. Um, but again, given all the background I just gave you, it's worth pointing out that the prevailing price for a particular drug in a particular community reflects the price or the cost of distributing something of dubious quality. And so, you know, someone like a franchisee will say, well, I could buy amoxicillin for $2 less than you'll sell it to me or than your approved vendor will sell it to me. And we say, yeah, and do you have any idea if it's actually amoxicillin, if it has the right active ingredient, if it's expired, all these other problems. Again, you know, scientific lab studies of drug quality over and over and over and over and over again show high percentages, different percentages, but high percentages of drugs as substandard in these markets. So we do make the case sometimes to patients to pay a little bit more, but generally we don't. Generally we keep it at that price, and that's one reason why it's tough to load in the costs of maintaining that supply chain into that. Price. Yeah. 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 Right. No, that's right. Um, uh, so we observe that most people can afford. So the average transaction, just if, out of, you know, in case you're curious, is something like a dollar, a dollar and fifteen cents in our clinic. So it's really inexpensive. And some other clinics in other areas might be as much as three dollars. I mean, our, some of our clinics in other areas, um, depending on where they are and what the services are. But um, there are some people that don't come in because of that, and we don't know how many there are. This is one reason why we don't want to do this test and why rerouting subsidies is sort of an easy and interesting, hopefully interesting maybe, theoretical topic, but the nuts and bolts of it um, take some, require or force some granular decisions about who is being subsidized, how do you say who they are, how do you make it, I mean, you can't, it's not, even an asset survey is not expensive, but you, you need to make the transaction cost of administering a subsidy so low when the subsidies might be 10 cents or 50 cents. You know, you can't go, Trying to scale down sort of stuff from the quote unquote insurance industry, um, th usually operating way high up in the pyramid in a place like Kenya where there's virtually no insurance for anybody except for rich people or formerly employed workers. Um, that, you know, the, the, the computer systems they use, the kind of um, the way that they would decide on a benefit, benefits package and how it would be applicable to a certain person would be way too expensive and laborious for our context. So. All of this takes kind of um, some ingenuity and in trying to figure out how to do this in a low cost way. Yeah.
Uh, it's another good question. Um, yes. Uh, so a few angles to this answer. First of all, it really one issue is that in some markets, governments won't allow this. So we're working in Rwanda right now, and the concept of a, as they call it, a health post in Rwanda, we're in partnership with the government and we constitute the lowest tier of the formal healthcare sector. They don't want anything except for their menu in those clinics. Um, and, you know, maybe that can change over time. Kenya is more open. Um, we do offer vitamins, uh, you know, family planning products, birth control pills, uh, soap, washing powder, glucose stuff, you know. Um, our experience with that has been mixed, and I would love for, this is an easily definable issue. Maybe you can solve it for us and be a hero, or somebody, somebody here should solve this. To me, it seems like, first of all, there's got to be a few products that actually have high margins, reasonable margins at least, that people would appreciate and that would be defensible in terms of being sold in the clinic. So if we started to try to sell like cigarettes or Coke or something, <laughs> probably we would have a hard time making that case. Um, although we did, have a, <laughs> we did have a case a few years ago where our staff came to me and said, Oh, we have bad news. When we were going around with our compliance inspections, one of the franchisees has wheeled in a, uh, a uh, soda uh, cart into the outlet and they're selling Fanta. Isn't that terrible? And I said, it is against our standards and we probably got to get it out of there. But actually, that's great because it seems like the franchisee has detected something in her local market. People want this and she's figured out a way to get it. So I thought it was, good, it was a good sign that there was entrepreneurial life at work in this far-flung region of Kenya. Um, but to answer your question directly, these products that we've had have had very slim margins. The drug margins are way higher for us because generic drugs are not uh, very expensive and people, even if they can only pay a dollar, you know, often the margins will be 50%. And so, whereas for over-the-counter products, and this has to do with a longer discussion about value-added tax and the sort of configuration of distributors and wholesalers and and the cost of distributing things in Kenya, but basically margins on over-the-counter goods have been very slim on the ones that we've sold. And we would like to try different things. Many of our franchisees request cosmetics, for example, which are sold in a lot of other clinics around. Um, people come to me often uh, saying, you know, oh, we're a group at such and such a university or such and such a company and we've developed this new nutrition product or this, these new eyeglasses or this new energy device or all these sort of things and many times the price points seem way too high, like 10 times our normal transaction, but um, I would it's one of the sort of mini holy grails among, among this. If you look at the unit economic performance of our units, of our clinics, if you just had five sort of items that are relatively uniquely sold by CFW that are over the counter that had good margins, it would transform the financial performance of these clinics. And so far we haven't found them or developed them, but I'd like someone to do that. Yeah. Um, Yes, we have some injectables. We have some clinics that have been able to, regis to register with the government to be part of the, EP the um, uh, national vaccination program, which requires refrigeration and so on. Um, uh, there is a scope of pharmaceuticals that are allowed and pharmaceuticals that are not allowed in this level of clinic in Kenya. So, but, sir, but, but you're right, I mean, it, part of our the way that our sort of product mix and menu have changed and evolved over the years has involved um, adding different drugs and taking some away and we can monitor sales. And we have, we have by the way, over 200 um, SKUs, which seems out of character for such a tiny outlet. And if you look at, you know, which the, the, what proportion of sales is constituted by which drugs, of course, there's the top 10 or 25 that are a huge proportion of sales. But so, we, so it is always of interest to find 
the latest drug. You know, there's also a clinical aspect though. You don't want, if patients sort of get excited, oh, you have Augmentin or something, I want that. Well, you don't really want to just hand out high power, you know, powerful or broad spectrum antibiotics for no reason to people, even if they're used to walking up and getting them. So we're trying to orient ourselves more towards selling high quality drugs, yes, but with a consultation that we're not just going to hand out drugs and especially not half courses of drugs and other things that are the norm. Irrational drug use is the you know big WHO umbrella for taking the wrong drugs, clinically inappropriate drugs, taking half a course of drugs because you can't afford it or when you feel better you stop taking it. All these things that we in America do as well. Yeah. Um, it's mostly that we stimulate it, but the nurse leads it and creates it in the sense that she has to gather her. We, uh, the, more, the most successful franchisees that we find are the ones who are really connected to their local communities. So she will gather, she'll find, for example, a women's group or a tree planting group or a, you know, a microfinance group or whatever, where it's a gathering of people and she'll ask the chief and so on if he can gather people. So they will do that part, but we'll sort of feed information to them. Here's what a nice promotional educational campaign on these products would be. Here's some posters we've printed up or some designs you could use for that. And that is definitely a part of our work. In fact, a, about a third of the people that we track as far as having reached and what's happening are through outreach programs either right near the clinic like you saw or we've also done similar things in schools and other places nearby. Yeah. Um, on the second point, um, again, it really differs by market and fundamentally when we go into a new market, meaning a new country, I mean, um, we have to figure out what, I since our mission is to have a network of hundreds of outlets, say eventually, a widely dispersed network of small outlets, what category of health worker is high enough in authority and clinical competence to actually address these diseases effectively, but low enough or prevalent enough for there to be um, enough of them to have a big network. So ideally you'd say, oh, a doctor can do, can do everything. Well, when we started working in Rwanda, there were 150 doctors for 10 million people. Same with pharmacists. So it's an absolute non-starter, and all of them in the main cities. Complete non-starter to talk about any involvement of doctors. Um, and in, by the way, in a place like, say, Bangladesh or something, that might be totally different. So different markets are different. Um, in Kenya, there are reasonable numbers of trained nurses. There are some laws about how long they have to work in the public sector before they work in the private sector and so on. But basically, we found that the more attractive the financial opportunity is and the sort of mission opportunity to serve their community, move closer to home, work by themselves, and so on, that the more uh, success we have in, in attracting franchisees. But we haven't done that anywhere near perfectly. Many of our franchisees are, you know, quote unquote, retired nurses. The retirement age in Kenya used to be 55. And so many nurses would want to continue working. They love the idea of running their own clinic. They had the right skills. And um, that's, I think, completely wonderful. And I have, you know, a lot of respect for those particular mostly women, but we also have male franchisees. Um, but we can't build a, a network just on retired, um, a retired population. So that's uh, something. On your first question about site selection, yes, we basically um, decide a general area in which we want to open a cluster of outlets for the sake of efficiency and regional support. Um, and then nurses and we collaborate to find sites. Like in many franchises, you ha we have criteria for what we think would make a good site, and nurses will say, oh, I have this site, and we'll say, you know, that's total, it's a terrible retail position. Uh, we don't think it will work, and a lot of that is, you know, hard to predict. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, good question. All of these have been astute questions. Um, so Kenya is a relatively developed market in this respect, relative to, say, the DRC, where we've 
started potentially working, or even Rwanda, which is just very small. Um, in Kenya, there are a, a large number of pharmaceutical um, suppliers of various kinds, especially in Nairobi. So among those, some of them only focus in branded drugs, essentially, and so that is outside the reach financially of most of our clientele. The vast majority, by the way, of essential drugs on any essential drugs list are off patent. So you don't, you know, there are some counterexamples like in malaria these days and so on, but um, we look for suppliers who can assure quality. And of course, no supplier that I've ever met in any country has said, yeah, you're right, we don't really test quality very well. Or yeah, we think we have some bad drugs here, but don't worry about it. You know, th they all will say, and they'll give reasons why they think their drugs are good. And yet the reality is if you go test drugs on the market, there are many bad drugs. And some of them don't come from official suppliers, by the way. Some of them come from people literally bringing a suitcase in from some other country or whatever, somehow, you know, getting drugs that are manufactured in Kenya that are not manufactured well and so on. Um, so, but there are very few um, suppliers in Kenya that will make a credible case for quality and we can supplement that by sending drugs to a testing lab and so on as well. So that's a, that factor looms large and when you combine that with the need for good prices, it's pretty, it shortens the list considerably. Yeah. So, I mean, picking up on this, this counter Great question. Yeah. Um, um, there's elements of both. So here, here's some, some sort of points on that. First of all, here's an example I use that is very rough, and I probably maybe shouldn't say on the video because any you know real person who's a medical person would probably just say that's dumb, but I'll say it anyway. Um, <laughs> diagnosis is so, is, it's not just drug quality that's bad, it's everything quality is bad. Diagnostic quality is bad, the quality of equipment is bad, the quality of the roads are bad, and so on, right? So um, let's take malaria. So we might say, well, don't people know they're buying counterfeit and substandard malaria medicine? And on one hand, the answer is yes, they feel like like if you talk to our patients and you say, why do you come pay a dollar or two at our clinic instead of go down the street to, to a place that's ostensibly free, they very readily will answer. And the answers they say are, when I come here, my, chi my child gets better. Uh, when I come here, I don't have to wait a long time. I get served quickly. And these people are, the people here are nice instead of being rude to me. Those are some anecdotal things that, people, you know, that, that we've heard. Um, uh, but, but on the other hand, if you think, so there's some awareness of drug quality, but think about, well, here's the, the example I maybe shouldn't give, which is about half the drugs are substandard, right? And, and, and about half the time we found when people think that they have malaria, they don't. So people get a fever, especially a cyclical fever, they think it's malaria. And so they go buy drugs. So you might say, how could they do that? Don't they, isn't it so obvious to them that most of the time they don't get better? But say that, say it's roughly half half and half like that, right? So I get a fever, half the time I actually have malaria and half I don't. But I always get malaria medicine, say. And half the time I get malaria medicine and I do have malaria, it's good. So only 20, so, so half the time I didn't have malaria, I get better. Half the time I did have malaria, I get good drugs. 75% of the time I get better from this supposed malaria. 25% of the time maybe I don't. So the problem is not zero to 100, like you don't get better at all with bad drugs. It's that in the whole ecosystem with diagnosis and everything, most of the time you do get better in a case like that. And so you're really going from like 75 to 100 in that case. Again, the percentages, you know, but yeah. Uh, but the demand side is absolutely where the rubber meets the road on these things. The, there's a huge gap between any policy, whether from the WHO or national policy or whatever that says, these are the drugs that should be used, these are how you should use them, this is how you should store them, this is how they should be priced, or any of these things get lost along the way of the value chain where every link on the chain is severely compromised. And by the end of the chain you have patients who don't want to take a malaria test for whatever reason, have you know, other drugs they're used to taking, 
split the, if, if you have a blister pack of drugs where there's the artemisinin drug and another drug, they don't take the partner drug because it has side effects they don't want. I mean, it's, it's just chaos. So very difficult to uh, get the right policy all the way down to the end user. Yeah. So the main way we use is that if we find clinics or if we find uh, drugs are being stocked by one of our clinics that we have not supplied or the proof supplier is not supplied, we instantly shut down the clinic and we tell the rest of the network. So this is the most egregious violation of our franchise agreement, which covers all kinds of standards. And this is kind of the fundamental reason we're using franchising. A lot of people think, oh, they're using franchising because of all the other reasons people use franchising, which are good reasons. But the main reason we use it is to control standards in a geographically dispersed network. That if the value of the business that we license to you is high, you have a disincentive to do any little micro transaction that will gain you money that might threaten that big uh, livelihood. So if you're gonna decide, some guy came to my door with a van and said I can sell you cheaper drugs, there's not, there's no one physically there to prevent that from happening, but if we catch them, you know, doing that, then that's the end of their business. They lose their investment, they lose their reputation, we take down the sign, they don't have, you know, that anymore. So that's, that's one main, re one main way at the end level, and then from the, we protect the supply chain from the beginning by sourcing good drugs in ways I was alluding to before, in answer to your question, and, uh, uh, you know, sort of normal supply chain management kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm, not so much at our, not so much the people in our actual system. It's a good question. We're depending on mostly now on one supplier in Nairobi who has the, one of the only WHO approved labs in Africa really for la drug testing labs. Uh, and they randomly test drugs off their own shelves and return it to return them to suppliers. As far as visual inspection, I mean, even big pharma people, if there's a well manufactured counterfeit drug, they can't tell visually. And we could never expect patients really to be able to tell. Obviously, if there's things like broken pills and sort of dissolution, you know, th that, that is conceivable. But for the most part, we're depending on actually, it's kind of a black box that we got to make sure what's in the box is right from the beginning and then nothing else except what's in the box ends up on the shelves of the clinic. But we're open, I mean, you know, there's other technologies and other things emerging for this. Yeah. Yeah, I am not enough of an authority to say if it's getting worse or better. I will say that the whole category of counterfeits and substandard drugs involves anything, you know, things on the spectrum from pills made out of chalk that are made with like a pill making machine in someone's living room or whatever, you know, in Kenya, all the way to serious counterfeit manufacturing plants in some other country that are pretty sophisticated and can produce big volumes. So, and then, of course, substandard drugs that are not intentionally counterfeit. It could be manufactured incorrectly, improperly, stored wrong, expired, and all these other things. Um, it's a good question. I think the reality is that it sort of hasn't emerged for us as an issue yet. That I don't think that even with 60, I mean, so in some areas, we certainly, like in central Kenya or western Kenya where we have a bunch of clinics, there's a general consumer awareness of our brand, but the awareness nationally or in some other community or region, no one would really know it. So, but, if, but it is a question we had, I was sat in on a class last night with the Domino's uh, international executive who mentioned that this is an issue, you know, they'll find counterfeit domino stores and we've seen I've seen a counterfeit subway in Nairobi and counterfeit Best Buy in Uganda and other things so um, preventing arbitrage is in you know I think is 
again, the, we're not at the high enough volumes for really people to take advantage of that. And I think that if someone started buying like a thousand bottles of something from one clinic, we'd know. So, but again, it theoretically, it's a good question, and it, and it is a very good question for these bed nets, for example, where I mean, yeah, again, the camera, but uh, <laughs> so. Um, you know, p entities that are subsidizing things in blanket ways are setting themselves up for situations where customers will buy 10 bed nets. So we, we don't allow more than a certain number of bed nets to be purchased by one person, as an example. Um, what was your first question? Oh, the different pricing. Yes, we do price things different regionally. Um, we have standard prices, retail prices that are promoted through the franchisees, but they're somewhat less in some areas and somewhat more in others. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, we don't officially. All these questions are perfect questions because they're the same questions I have about how do you determine um, pricing and how do you target subsidies. So, for example, um, with seasonality of income, which is a huge issue like I'm, or a huge phenomenon, it would make sense for us to try and one of the next series and tests we want to try after these mobile phone coupons would be, for example, with nutrition. We don't do very much explicitly with nutrition. There's a lot of malnutrition and so on. What would be the best, could, could, we, have, could we take you know, our clinics in four categories and in one category promote just make nutrition products available with no announcement or discount in another give a discount or another, maybe a subscription scheme um, that would allow people to prepay for nutrition products, maybe at a discount or not, and so on. And could we see what motivates consumers to actually take up nutrition, assuming we can find appropriate products or tools? Um, just saying, well, people are malnourished, so here, here's some sprinkles to sprinkle on their porridge. You know, uh, to me, it just seems like you're going to run into all these real sort of anthropological and social and perception-based um, realities, and we, we wouldn't really learn that much. So we want to do this sort of A, B, or A, B, C testing um, to see what would result in better uptake. And seasonal pricing would be a great uh, thing to include in that testing. Yeah, I agree with the question. We've looked some at that. We have found, so in t we're making some big changes in distribution actually right now. And one big change is that for a long time we actually distributed the products ourselves, thinking that because we had, partly thinking that because we have to visit these clinics anyway to maintain compliance and collect records and all this stuff, well, why don't we just throw the box in the truck and then we don't have to pay for it to be distributed. But it turns out that leads to sort of an irrational visit schedule. I mean, if you're, if you're a person who has 20 clinics under your purview and 10 of them are doing really well, we don't, you shouldn't be visiting that clinic very often. There's no reason to. Uh, and there's some other struggling clinics that could really use a couple of days of your health. So this idea, well, we just visit every clinic once a month, that is not really the optimal way. And yet you have to do that if you're the one distributing drugs. So we've gotten out of the drug distribution business, looked at different options. Some of the suppliers will distribute. Often they won't distribute all the way to our clinics, unfortunately, because they're too remote. So we've had regional, they'll distribute to a regional central place and we or others can distribute the rest of the way. Sometimes franchisees are willing to come pick up some products, but mostly it's too big for like if they're riding on the back of a motorcycle, it's too big a box. And we haven't solved this in a way that I find that satisfactory, but um, we have parsed it recently and found, for example, that the distribution of the bed nets was more than half of our distribution costs, which I just was oblivious to before. So that's an interesting, you know, reality. Um, but basically, as far as piggybacking on existing, there's an issue with regulations governing the um, who has control of pharmaceuticals from one point to another. So if you tell a supplier, yeah, by the way, we're just going to put your drugs on some random truck that happens to be going there that's delivering bread or newspapers or phone cards or Coke, they won't necessarily accept that. So I'm not saying that's an insurmountable obstacle, but it's, it's a good question. It's sort of a work in progress. We've already 
very gone past the time a little bit, so uh, we'll just turn the schedule uh, I'll just kick this up to you. And thanks, Greg, for coming. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much for the good discussion. I, I really I like the questions, and you know, if any of you want to email or call with insights or out of the box ideas, to be honest, I'm hoping to kind of learn as much from being here for a day or two as anything I could say. There's so many of these tricky and interesting, I just find this stuff endlessly intriguing, the real on the ground stuff. And I'm sure you guys are getting exposure to a lot of what other people are trying that has worked or not. And that, would be, that's, that kind of stuff is helpful to us. So we're always, we're always open to your ideas.